Um, so we've been talking about that whole, we've committed to a first layer, and then we're trying to um, not mess it up, not ruin it, because yeah, it's every decision. The, the thing is, I think, is that the deeper you get into the decision-making process, the more decisions that go into your painting, I mean, there's just more likelihood of them being wrong. That's why if you're Tom Hoffman and you have four brush strokes, um, those all, every one of those four brush strokes better be right or it's not gonna work, right? Um, but if you have, uh, but on the other hand, he only has four chances to blow it. <laughs> so, so the fewer brush strokes you do, actually, um, the almost safer you are. And, uh, and so sometimes that's why people will leave paintings like deliberately unfinished or they'll never get past that first layer because it's just scary to think about increasing the potential that you might make a mistake. So we have 500 decisions go into one painting. Well, yeah, how many of those are you gonna get wrong? And how many does it take to ruin the painting? I like to have a focus. Um, I like to give myself an assignment when I start painting. What, um, and just to have something on my mind. So I started, we've been warming up, we've been painting for an hour or so. And so I was working on this little landscape, thinking about what we saw in Ireland this uh, yesterday as we toured, and wanting to get that rolling pastoral hills thing going on. Unfortunately, I forgot to put sheep in this version, so I'm gonna have to paint it again. <laughs> it just seems wrong to have an Irish landscape without sheep. But as I painted this, um, I think it's easy to lose sight of your objection, objective when it's a new scene. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at my reference photo, which I had on my phone here, and then just trying to depict what I see. Then the objective is just what am I seeing and how do I get it on the paper? But having a deeper purpose than that is, is helpful to us in our interpretation as artists, right? Um, so uh, my other deeper purpose would have been just trying to get that patchwork quilt of, of the land down on my paper. And um, now I, I do try to keep a little pressure off that this is my first version of this scene. So I know that it's going to be um, a little bit of muddling my way in. So I, I'm going to be much more reliant on my reference photo. And um, so then there's going to be less opportunity for self-expression. I just don't know it well enough. Um, but I, I am trying to look. Uh, I guess here the objective was um, trying to pay attention to the values and the colors. And, and then we start thinking about, and then you start adding in stuff, uh, positioning, um, trying, to get, trying to get all the details in. And then I'm moving down from the top to, to the bottom. I, was, I had the reference photo um, starting with the sky and then just moving down. And as I moved down, I realized, wait a minute, there was a whole tree on this side that I didn't paint. And then this little house was actually on this side in my reference photo. Um, <laughs> And so then I decided to put it in and I only had one space left that I could do it. And, and then down here, there was actually this boat with red flowers and I just knew the red would distract from everything else. So I had to choose to take that out. But all of this was happening kind of on the fly, which makes it a less strong painting than if I knew um, from the very beginning what I was gonna put in and what I was gonna take out. And so that's part of getting to know a reference photo. But from there, once we get to know a reference photo, then we get freed up to do a little bit more uh, in terms of self-expression. So we're gonna look at a couple more paintings here. Um, yesterday I ended up painting three versions of our visit to Downpatrick Head and um, those beautiful cliffs. And I think we were all struck, it's a sunny day, so we were all struck by the beauty of the water, um, just the colors in the water were phenomenal. And the whiteness because um, the, the waves breaking and the, the tumultuousness of the water, there was a lot of white actually, um, which we know as artists, we don't have to paint at all because it's our, it's our watercolor paper. So my first version of Down Patrick Head, I decided I was going to just paint the stack um, because it simplified. It, didn't, it released me from that feeling that I needed to paint the whole scene, all the cliffs and all the details, even though I had some really lovely panoramas on my phone. And so when we painted this, uh, rather than painting top to bottom, and actually this top inch is going to be cut off, so that's not actually there. Um, 
so I actually, instead of painting from top to bottom, which we often do, or painting from back to front, which is another thing we often do, um, I painted the stack first, and then I had to paint everything around it. And it's maybe not the most efficient way of painting, but it really helps you focus on your focal point. So I think it's actually, it can be a really useful thing. So sometimes my challenge to myself is start with the focal point and then just get in the bare minimum to support it. So that's often the challenge that I give myself. Um, and in this case, um, I simplified my water to quite a great extent. Uh, we tend to zero in on all those tiny little details and I really tried not to do that as well. Now, um, this one, I think we can see some of the influence from the first painting in the second. Um, the good news here was I didn't feel like I needed to change a lot of my colors. Sorry, Louise. Um, so I didn't feel like I needed to change my colors. I was happy with the colors I'd chosen in this one. And that made my job a lot easier. In this version, I had to make a decision about what colors to use for my stack and for my water. Um, as soon as I went to my second version, that was a weight off my mind. I didn't have to think about that anymore. I knew what was going to work. So um, you could call this maybe the version where I figured out what colors to use. And maybe that could have been my primary focus. If it, the colors hadn't gone well, then I would have had to experiment and try new things. And most of the time, if you're learning this stuff, if you're working out those kind of um, questions in your paintings, you're not going to be painting this big. I'm doing this, I'm doing large stuff, but that's not you know, your obligations. So maybe this is all happening on a small eight by 10 or smaller, you know, for you. And um, another challenge, uh, and something we didn't do, something I didn't do was paint a value study. Um, painting the value study helps answer those other questions. Uh, another question, which is, you know, how, where's my areas of greatest contrast? How would I depict this if I was limited to just one color? And you know, painting it in the value study means that question gets answered and it's much easier than to paint when you start adding colors in. And then when you establish your colors, well then all you have to worry about is maybe the shapes. So for this version, I knew my colors. I wanted to change up my composition a bit. So here we're painting the cliff instead of the stack. And you, I think you can see that I was feeling a little braver when it came to the, the water as well, mm -hmm. you know, and putting those contrasts in. This worked so successfully. Just this area is my favorite part of this painting because it has this beautiful soft flow between the indigo and the phthalo turquoise. Uh, that was really exciting to me. And so in this one, you know, I pushed it even a little bit further and started adding um, stronger darks and uh, greater contrast. And then I added some spatter over here, which was fun to do. This one doesn't feel done. Uh, I'd like to add maybe a little more texture into my cliff to give it some uh, definition. So, uh, what what color green is that? The top, bright green. It's the green gold. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think it's Daniel Smith green gold and not core, because cores is a little bit, um, yeah, it's a little darker, I think, too. I don't know. It feels. Yeah, it, but may, yeah, maybe a little yellow or two. It is more goldy. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but adding a tiny bit of phthalo turquoise into your core green gold could give you just that slightly greener hue as well. Now, this third variation, um, it's interesting to me that I have far fewer colors in my cliff now in this third one. And it was a different reference photo, just everyone just got changed up a little bit. So now suddenly I have, uh, again with the bold darks in my water, but actually fewer white areas. And those fewer white areas really make your eye move over into this area. It's kind of a triangular shape, isn't it? And then I was really brave about my dark cliffs. So, um, which was hard to do because when your reference photo tells you that something is dark or near black. Um, I'm, I'm a little hesitant sometimes to go as dark as my reference photo says because it tends to flatten things out. But in this case, it really works for creating that contrast. I wanted that feeling of the water breaking at the base of the cliff. And I got to do it with the bare minimum of brush strokes here. And that was really fun for me and exciting. Um, and so this one is actually quite extremely simplified. Um, especially when we look at our first variation. 
which has a lot more small shapes, I think, and a lot more um, complexity of color in the cliff and the in the stack. And here I just simplified everything's big shapes. Um, in doing multiple variations, you have the freedom to ask new questions every time you're painting. So how would I simplify this? What would I do if I could only paint this in 10 minutes? What could I do? Um, that's one thing I do, I'll give myself a time limit. So I might, yeah, I'll give myself a time limit. What would I, how would I paint this if I only had 10 minutes? And actually these two paintings, I did in, I think 45 minutes. It went really fast. And pushing yourself to do something in a, as one layer. What would I do if I could only paint this in one layer? How would that look? And, um, and one layer as in not that I keep adding things until the paper dries, because that's not really painting in one layer. If you're, you know, going back over top with fussy brush strokes, that's not really painting in one layer, even though it still hasn't completely dried yet. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You're painting like you're painting three layers, only it just hasn't dried yet. Um, but so how would I do it if I could only touch each area of the paper once? You know, what if I wasn't allowed to go back over anything? Um, and so that's a, that's a question. And it's, to me, it's almost like playing a game then, right? That kind of challenge of, um, you know, how would I, what do I do? How do I do it um, this time for this version? And I think we have a wonderful example in Monet. Uh, and I've talked about this before. He painted over 250 paintings of water lilies. And I think, uh, I'm trying to remember, I think it was even more of his haystacks. So we hear Monet's water lilies and we think it was one painting. It wasn't, there was over 250 of them. So he was quite willing to be very boring. And I feel sorry for his friends, to, you know, in his painting group, because he's like, here's another one. It's the best one ever. <laughs> and, you know, or whatever. And then he's, and what would it be like if I painted in the, in the early morning, in the late afternoon, and so forth? And what if I could only use, you know, vertical strokes? Or, you know, so there's so many questions we can ask. What if I painted everything in cool colors and then added one? warm color. What if I painted this as geometric shapes? And we saw that in the art gallery yesterday. Um, everything in that one painting was um, a rectangle or a square. And so, and that's just an artist asking themselves that interesting question. And for all I know, that's all that artist does is rectangles and squares in all their paintings. I wouldn't be surprised actually. So we, as artists, we get to be willing to be one trick ponies and have one thing that we do really well and that makes us really interested and excited. So it doesn't mean you have to answer all these questions in all your paintings. Find something that engages you. And hopefully, and if you're learning, which you are, um, helps you grow. So, you know, maybe that's focusing on value for a really long time. And um, looking back at my career and my learning process, my paintings were not strong as a new painter um, in my first five or six years of painting because I didn't understand about value. And so I was painting the colors that I saw. So that's a dark green, that's a light blue, rather than thinking about the values and how they related to each other. The other thing that I did was most of my photos, my reference photos were taken on overcast days because it's just easier to take a good photo when the light isn't strong. So none of my photos had a strong light source, which made it really hard to create good contrasts. So um, actually some of the, so that makes it, can, can make it really hard as an artist to um, paint with strong contrasts mm -hmm. because it is just easier to work from reference photos that have that more diffused light. And so that's where I like to think about exaggerating. So what if I exaggerated all my darks? What if I made all my light value, lightest values just white? Um, so those are other good questions to ask. And there's, I mean, there's really no limit to the questions you could ask. What if I drew everything with indigo and, my, and a fine pointy brush, like a coloring book, and then filled it in? I mean, that would be an interesting thing to try. So it's not necessarily what's going to make me a better artist today, but just what interests me. Um, you know, and, and what, how can I, how can I incorporate that into my painting? My harvest dance painting, which we were talking about, the field of wheat, 
and the pink sky. Uh, I was inspired to do that because I saw an artist who painted a yellow sky. And I was like, that is the coolest thing ever. And it's a beautiful sky. And I didn't even think about the fact that it was yellow until I spent a little more time looking at that painting. And so that was really cool to realize that um, you, there's no, color's no boundary, you know. And so what would, what would it look like if we changed up the colors of our down Patrick head? Now that's a problem because it was so beautiful there. Why would we want to? But, um, you know, we get to have, uh, we get to answer questions and we get to do it in a really, sometimes in an interesting and weird way. Um, and we've seen weird art, right? Um, and those are artists who um, let their little quirks drive their paintings. And why wouldn't we do that? And we have more freedom to do that as we get to know what we like and who we are and how to handle, how to manipulate the, the medium. And so as um, we're in this stage, and I know, you, I know you feel frustrated because your painting just doesn't do what you want it to do and it doesn't match what you're seeing up here. And there's a lot of faith in painting. Um, I, I really think of it as a, as a bit of a faith journey because we don't have anyone telling you, I can teach you to paint, it's gonna take 40 hours of actual study and then you're gonna have mastered the medium. It doesn't work that way. There's so many decisions that go into painting. What brush, you know, what tools do I use? Uh, what colors do I choose? What am I painting today? And then how do I get that to all come together? What do I start with? And in watercolor, you know, when, where you start, and what white areas you leave, those have a big, um, a big impact on your painting. They're gonna really affect the finished product. We're not like oil and acrylic painters where you can just keep adding paint until you get a result that you're happy with. Our, our keep adding paint is keep adding paint to this paper and then do this version and this version and this version. So we have stacks and stacks. So what we should just do is be like an oil and acrylic painter and just glue them all together. <laughs> um, you know, maybe that would help us visualize and realize that we're not failures because we do keep doing more versions. It's, it's our version of continuing to add paint. And uh, so, yeah, we can quietly judge all the artists who have like stacks and stacks of paint layers on their oil and acrylic paintings and say, well, I don't have to do that because I get it right the first time. <laughs> and just met, not mention all the ones at home in the studio. So, should I show you something? Do you want to get back to painting? Okay, let's see what we've got here. 